Okay, so yes, I'm Vicky Cameron, and I am that very long title that I always forget what order it goes in and how to say it. Um, basically, I'm in the old language. I'm the um, Children's Commissioner for Merton, but I also cover Wandsworth now as well. So I have a very, very big remit of services to cover and areas. I have a very, very vast role. If we go on to the next slide. So what do I do? I do an awful lot. Um, so I am responsible for um, contracts for children's community within CLCH for Merton. Um, Merton's a very unique borough in the sense that we don't have an acute hospital within the borough. So we share um, our acute services with St. Helier's and with St. George's. But from Merton point of view, we don't actually manage either of those contracts. The St. Helier's contract is managed by Sutton and the um, St. George's contract is managed by Wandsworth. So we don't actually have management um, responsibilities for either of the contracts. We do try and do joint ma contract management meetings with Sutton for the St. Helier's children's contracts, but they have kind of dropped to the wayside a little bit and we're trying to restart them. So I also um, have an active involvement with SEND, supporting Karishma um, and our executives in attending all the SEND meetings with the local authority and with education, involved in nurse, school special school nursing services, ensuring they're in place, they're functioning, they've been commissioned appropriately with um, specific specifications. I'm also responsible for chairing the Children's Continuing Care Health Panel, and ratifying packages of care that children with needs beyond those that can be met by universal services, um, what packages of care they need to help support the families to care for the child. Um, I work in collaboration with public health to ensure health provision across Merton, looking at um, issues such as dental health, dental hygiene, immunisation, um, obesity and ensuring and looking at how we can move all of those forward. Um, I liaise with certain ICB colleagues to ensure St Helier's contract monitoring is in place, as I've said to you, and we are at the moment looking at the um, well-known lack of community paediatricians at St Helier and the massive gap there is there and what we can do to try and help mitigate that. And we're doing that across South West London, working with St George's as well because Epsom St Helier are now aligned with St George's and they are known as GESH, George's Epsom St Helier. So GESH are looking at how they can support each other with this lack of community paediatricians and um, community assessments for things and the waiting list for ASD um, diagnosis is 12 months at least at the moment and we know how difficult that is. But we are also, by that sense, working with our public health colleagues to see what we can do to help try and mitigate that and reduce the stress and anxiety of the families waiting for these assessments by looking at developing a um, health visitor role for children with um, suspected ASD or neurodiverse. And um, if a specific role is relevant, or do we just need to make sure all of our health visitors have a resource to go to if there is support that's needed for families and do they know where to go and how to direct the families to get that support because we feel that often families want a diagnosis and a label because they think that's the only way they can get the support but actually that's not the way they can get the support there's a lot of things for families without getting the ASD diagnosis um, to support them um, and one of the things that everyone is very mindful of is actually sometimes being labelled is more detrimental than beneficial. I'm also involved in the procurement of services for children and young people. Um, and unfortunately, at the moment within South West London, we are unable to procure any new services for anybody, children, adults, learning disabilities, mental health, unless we decommission something because we've been put in a triple lock by um, NHS England, which means we have to go through about five or six committees for agreement to fund things. Um, and it's very hard work um, and it's it's not where we want to be and it's not anything we are 
implementing internally ourselves. We are fighting very, very hard to get everything we can get. Um, so we've got to go through at least three committees to get anything agreed, um, write business cases, write papers, um, and we are trying. Um, I What else do I do? I come to meetings such as this. I link in with the local authority, with their kids first meetings and um, with their education. So we also link in with the um, alternative provision for education meetings, the um, EHCP coordinators and um, all other sort of health side of things. I'm also working hard with Karishma and her counterparts in the other in Wandsworth and with the education authorities to um, be ready for the next SEND inspection. So we're doing a lot of back work in the background on preparation for inspection for SEND. Next slide. So the joint forward plan, I was told you would want to, you wanted to um, have a little bit of information on this. So the joint forward plan, this plan is about ensuring co-production including designing children's EHCPs with parents, carers and children, young people and making sure it's embedded in SEND by 2526. Now, what does that mean? It's a great thing to say, but what does that actually mean? So what that means is Karishma, ourselves and our local authority partners are making sure that the EHCP process is robust, that everyone who is meant to be contributing to it, contributes to it. And even if a health professional is asked for a statement or a report, they're not allowed anymore to say the child is not known to them. If they're being asked for a report about this child, there's a reason for that and they need to do a report and they need to see the child. Um, I know the local authority with Karishma support have developed an integrated care system dashboard for tracking and monitoring where, the, where each child is within that process. We're also ensuring we've got improved transition pathways by collaboratively working with the local authority and with social services as they have transition meetings and coordinators. We are ensuring there's increased support for the DCO and DMO, and that's we've got a um, consistent approach across Southwest London by our head of SEND for Southwest London, who is Alison Stewart, and she is working collaboratively with the DCO and DMOs from all the Southwest London boroughs to ensure that they're all working in the same way. And that is part of what we want from the Joint Forward Plan. Next slide. So key points, shortage of therapists. I know this is probably high on everyone's um, awareness. There is a national shortage for therapists, especially the relevant and the prevalent pediatric field. Speech and language OT therapists are like gold dust and it's really difficult to recruit. We are doing the best and CLCH for Merton have done very, very well with ensuring the gaps are filled with um, a regular review. We have regular meetings with them to ensure that they are meeting their um, fulfillment. And one of the issues they have is when somebody goes on maternity light from dietetics, it's very difficult to get interim cover in. So once they can, so there's often a gap, but we try our best not to have those gaps and to pre-plan for that. Community paediatrics at St. Helens, as I've already said, we know that's an issue and we're working very hard to support that. What they are currently covering is their statutory duties because that's the priority. And this is where it's things like lack assessments, lack health assessments, EHCP reports, but unfortunately, it's not it's not a statutory duty for the um, assessments for um, diagnosis. What they have done is run additional nurse led clinics to try and take some of the weight off of the um, pediatricians. And that is something that our senior team at Southwest London level are working on with Epsom, St. Helier and St. George's to see what else we can do to help mitigate and reduce those waiting lists. As I said, there are waiting times, there are challenges that are going on, but by working across Southwest London and by involving St. George's, who've got a much larger pool of community paediatricians, now they are linked with St. Helier's, we are hoping we can bring that down slightly. I believe, as do others within their network, that actually by having 
experienced clinical nurse specialists in that field that can take time a weight off the community pediatricians the problem from a community pediatrician's perspective is that they feel that any child under the trust must have a named pediatrician which is true and therefore they feel there's that responsibility on them to ensure everything is done correctly and ensured so it doesn't for them feel that it takes that amount of um, time off of them from a CAMS perspective, um, I understand you've got a meeting with Jackie Wilson and Rosemary Ajibulu, is that correct? Yes, it's in the pl- still in the planning stage, Vicky. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, so Jackie is um, covering for Sarah Keane. I don't know if people were aware of Sarah Keane. She was our previous CAMS commissioner who went on a year sabbatical. She has just um, come back to the ICBN and said that she's not going to be returning. So Jacqueline's contract has been extended till April 24, um, whilst we go through the reorganisation within the ICB. So she will be here until April of next year. So she is really knuckling down and getting on with some very good work, ensuring that we've got the MHSTs, which is the mental health and school teams, all um, set up and working correctly. She is also ensuring that our um, counselling services for young people, working very hard in that contract sorted out and renewed, um, and then once she's managed to do that, we'll be able to look at some other innovative things and what we can do. Um, and that's where we are with that. So she and Jackie and Rosemary will be able to talk to you about the CAMS provision. The other thing we do a lot of, um, and I think maybe um, of interest to some of you, is the children's continuing care um, packages. So there is a national framework for children's continuing care. And this is complete, this is very different to what everyone calls CHC, which is continuing health care, which is the adult provision and is a statutory provision. Children's continuing care um, is referred to really as CCC. There's a national framework of guidance for ICBs of how to um, assess and what the recommendations are, but there's no statutory requirement with it. Now, I don't know an ICB that does that and says, no, we're not going to provide. But what it means is with children's continuing care, there is the expectation that it will be very much joint packages with social services. So social services will pay for all the social care elements of the child's care, such as um, going out, um, any support that's needed with washing, dressing, and all those elements of social care. Healthcare is for those things where the child can, the family needs support in managing their health needs, interventions for health, such as suctioning, ventilation, um, and all those elements. The one thing about continuing care is it's not respite, and the family have to be in the house at all times while continuing care packages are in place because it's a support package to support them caring, it's not respite. And I know that sounds really harsh and that's not it's but that unfortunately is how it's commissioned. It's only commissioned to be delivered when the family are in the home, not when the family go out of the home. Um, now, it doesn't mean that it has to be the parents. It can be another responsible adult who is competent at caring for the child to be there with the carer so the parents can go out if that's what's required. Next one. So what is available? At the moment, what we have um, funded by the ICB in conjunction with Merton Local Authority is ACES, the Youth Club for High Functioning Autistics, age 14 to 18. Um, And this club is um, for young people who are able to make their own way to the um, club. Um, And it's so it's for high functioning and um, the feedback is that it's very much existed and that nothing else in Merton exists like this. And this is what the families really like. Um, next page. So M- Merton Autistic Service, this is MAPS. This is something, again, we joint fund with the local authority and it's advisory service for families with um, children with autism. Um, and it's a peer service. It's confidential informal sessions parent advisors 
um, and that, and it provides communication and support around challenging behaviour, self-harming, sleep issues, anxiety and those other kinds of issues. The other thing that with um, the CAMS team will probably talk to you about is that we do also have our key worker scheme where if you've got a child with um, autism or learning disabilities who is on the dynamic support register, they will be given a allocated a key worker who will work with them and the family to help support them in offering techniques and management um, on how to manage the child's behaviours and to prevent um, a admission to um, an acute setting. They will also run this um, care education treatment reviews within the CAM service for children who require them. Next slide. So I'm Karshma Palmer and I'm the designated clinical officer for special educational needs and disabilities. Um, and you know, thank you for inviting me today. It's it's a real pleasure. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to go into a little bit about the designated clinical officer role, but actually I couldn't really do that without talking about our designated medical officer. So I don't know if everyone is aware, but we in Martin do have our own designated medical officer and his name is Dr. Osmond. He's given me permission to show his picture so you know what he looks like. And if we look at the Send and Disability Code of Practice and look under section 3.45, they kind of describe the um, DMO role for us, which is a role to support the CCG, which is now the ICB, in maintaining its statutory responsibilities for children and people with SEM and disabilities. Um, by prov uh, they provide a point of contact for local partners and provide advice on SEM or disabilities. If you could move on to the next slide, please. The key functions of the role is, these, the, these are the main four, but I wouldn't say it's just defined by these four. I think we do a lot outside of this, but the key functions that they talk about, which is also in the DMO and DCO handbook, just in case anyone is interested, is um, having oversight and assurance across all health services, 0 to 25, delivering health care to children and people with SEND, coordination and assurance of strategic help, health input into the EAC process and reporting of health position and audits to quality committees, strategic um, assurance reaccountability of commissioners' contribution to the development of the Joint Commission on Local Area SEND strategies and championing co-production as a way of working within and across health. If you don't mind going to the next slide, please. So now that I've kind of touched upon about the designated medical officer, what the code of practice does say that there is local flexibility for this role to be undertaken by a, another competent and qualified professional like a nurse or a therapist, um, which are the two main kinds of DCOs that you'll find. You'll, you'll see more therapists in the DCO role than nurses. Um, and actually within South West London, we have like a nice mix. I think we have two nurses um, and two therapists and our head of send is a therapist as well um, to kind of get the medical side from the nurses and support and but also the therapist side. So like um, across South West London, we have like a mix of DCOs with a mix of different backgrounds and bring a lot of different roles to the table, if that makes sense. Um, we're actually really lucky, Martin. So um you have myself who's the DCO and you have the DMO. In some areas you just have a DMO and in some areas you just have a DCO because they're non statutory roles. So we're actually quite lucky in Martin to have both. Um, the code of practice does say that they must have appropriate expertise and links with other professionals to enable them to exercise them in relation to children, young people and adults with EHC planning plans, so it's zero to 25. And even though the role is non-statutory um, in send inspections, if there is no DMO or DCO, the local area has to be able to ev evidence how they have oversight and assurance. So actually, I would say that um, South West London see the strength in having a DMO and a DCO. Um, we, we try our best to make sure that there's like no duplication of work. Um, Vicky kind of touched upon the community paediatric situation at the moment. So our DMO actually sits within the community paediatric team at Epsom and St. Helier. Um, and at the moment, his main focus is ensuring the advice for education healthcare needs assessments are put through. 
um, and within the six week statutory time scale um, and doing more work with the community paediatricians around advice. Um, whereas I tend to go outside and work with other providers like CAMS, like our um, colleagues at CLCH, so our therapists and our nursing team. So um, at the moment, that is Dr. Osmond's main, main focus. Um, and I think it's understand understandable just to make sure that we're getting that advice in on time. If you don't mind moving to the next slide, please. So um, I was kind of, um, kind of thinking about what I could put down here in terms of DCA priorities going forward. So I just wanted to touch upon my role and I don't know if anyone was aware, but I actually was only covering Merton 50% of the time till June, 2023. Um, and from June, 2023, Merton has actually committed to having a full-time DCR, which has gone from um, 18.75 hours a week and having shared time in Sutton. So I used to cover number of London Borough of Sutton and London Borough of Merton. Um, and now I'm full-time like Merton. I will say that um, I am due to go on maternity leave, but Merton have been very, very proactive in having interim support in place already. He'll be starting next week and I'm still here next week. So there's an overlap and there'll be like a really good handover. Um, and we're looking at our forward plan. And in our forward plan, we've got working with parents, carers and children and people to achieve true co-production. And I think as an ICB and an ICS to Southwest London level as well, I think we're very aware that we can be better at this. Um, I don't think I don't think that we're where we want to be, and I'm sure a lot of parent carers and children and people might feel the same. But I think we're quite good at engaging. But if we were talking about true co-production, are we really there? Yeah, I think there's a lot of work that we can do together. And so that's why I'm really thankful that I'm here today. Um the days here, we kind of want to look at supporting the ICB to create processes and resources around supporting children with medical conditions. And I touch upon this because um, a child or young person can have a medical condition, but not an education need, so therefore won't meet, for example, the criteria for having an ACP plan, but it doesn't mean that they don't have conditions that um, kind of restrict their access to education. So it's kind of working on that process. What does that look like? Um, talking about and making it aware for children and people and their parents and carers of what is available in our universal offer. And um, because there is actually a lot of things available in our universal offer, but I think it's more about communicating that and, you know, bringing that forward. Um, to review the health content on the local offer and update information available for children and people and their families. I think this is a big one for health. Um, I think a lot of feedback that we've had recently as a SEN system, so across educational health and social care, is that um, families want a central point where they can have all the information that is easy to access, is accessible in terms of um, content, jargon-free, all of that kind of stuff. So we'll be working with our providers to make sure that that local offer is kept up to date. Um, with the most relevant information and contacts because you can always go on there and be like so who do I contact about this and to make sure that we have an up-to-date contact um, number not necessarily individual teams because we can have people leave or move or go on maternity or sick um, but maybe some numbers on there that you can contact services and providers if needed. Um, to review provider standard operating procedures for contributing to education healthcare needs assessments and annual reviews. And this is in um, including internal audits and DIPLA. So like, um, I would say as Merton as a system, we're very good for having standard operating procedures for our zero to 18 services, but we really want to work on improving our 18 to 25 years because we know that's just as important. Um, so I would say that we did a lot of work for our written statement of action when we had that, when it came to zero to 18, but we've still got a, a little bit further to go with our 18 to 25 services. Um, it's We want to deliver like a training program across health providers and we'll be looking at using the CDC SEND framework, um, which will include kind of learning from tribunals, where we like live experiences. Any cases that we do share will be anonymous, like there will be no patient identifiable information, but I think it's important for our health professionals to understand um, what happens at tribunal. They could be asked to attend tribunal, um, parent care children, people rights when it comes to tribunal, and kind of 
as a system as having a learning culture so being quite open to that you know there are things we could do better next time and I think that's really really important um I touched upon already so working with our adult providers at 18 to 25 years to provide support and advice around educational health care needs assessment and that includes transition as well like transition from children's to adult services like Vicky mentioned for example um, children's continuing care and then moving to adults continuing health care that's something that we I think do quite well in terms of communication but is there an improvement mechanism there that we can use or something that works well in that system that we can then duplicate in others um, creation and oversight of processes around transition and health care from children to adult services so I'll just touch up on that um, do you mind moving to the next slide please so I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to kind of ask so I touched upon kind of true like true co-production and what does that really look like earlier and I thought this would be a good opportunity to ask parents and carers while I've got you what do you feel is the best way moving like moving forward how is the best way that we work together so I don't know at this point Tracy if you wanted to pause again just Um, so the last piece I wanted to touch on um, was the kind of support and medical needs and education element. So um, Mel, who is um, a Kids First representative that comes to some of our SEND meetings at SEND governance level, um, she mentioned this would be a good um, forum um, for me to try and gather some views about this piece of work that we've, we've just started to put together. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it. So. Um, in the past, this was before our last inspection, which um, I don't know if everyone remembers, that was October 2022. Um, I actually put together um, booklets and it was to support our education colleagues on how to um, access support for children and young people with uh, medical conditions and how they can access education. Um, so these booklets were actually originally created with input from the specialist nurses. So those are the specialist nurses that sit in Epsom and St. Helia and our community nursing team, as well as our health visiting and school nursing teams. We had two booklets. So one of the booklets covered diabetes, asthma, epilepsy, and allergies. Um, the reason that we went with these conditions initially um, was because those are the specialist nurses that sit within Epsom and St. Hanyar and that's the, um, that's where we felt we could start and then kind of expand our piece of work. Um, booklet 2 was a, um, about central lines, enteral feeding, tracheostomy, oxygen therapy and suction requirements and that was um, with our community nursing teams and health visiting and school nursing teams again and those are the services that the community nurses cover. Um, Information within those booklets included like local procedures on like medical reviews, how to access training and advice around completing healthcare plans. And it was so, for example, if a child or young person had asthma, how would the school know who to contact when it came to more information about the last medical review? How do, who do they contact when it came to completing a healthcare plan for that child or young person to access education? Um, it was about accessing training. So if they had to, for example, use an EpiPen in an emergency, who would provide that EpiPen training um, and where to access that information? Um, what we found was when I initially did this piece of work, it wasn't launched how we wanted it to be launched and it wasn't utilized the way that we wanted it to be utilized. So I went back and reviewed that a couple of months ago and I took this to what we call the SEND Governance Board, which um, where there's representative across health, education and social care to obtain kind of views on how we move forward, make this a better piece of work and what else we can cover. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as an ICB, we really have recognised that we do need to be better when working with our children and people and their parents and carers. And then Mel said to bring it here today. So I thought that this would be a perfect opportunity. And I was just wondering if everyone's OK with that. If, and if we try and gather some of your views today. So, um, this this is just our email contacts um, of mine and Sue. So Sue's will be my is my interim and she starts next week. But I'm both we're both still around. Um, and like I said, my official last day is the 29th. But um, just to remind anyone who's brought up any concerns or issues in the chat today or um, 
in our discussion, I've said that I'm um, happy and available. So if you contact me on this number um, and this email, that would be great. I would say that sometimes it's easier to email me just in case I'm in a meeting um, and I don't catch your phone call. If if I don't know your number or you don't leave a message, I won't know who to call back. So if you call and I don't pick up, make sure you leave a voicemail with your details to call back. Um, and it might be easier to just email me and say, these are my concerns. Can you call me? And we can book a time in and we can have a conversation. Um, Sue's email address is there at the bottom and she's working on next week getting a phone number as well. But that's her email address. So um, that's both of our contact details.